today is week one of a teaching series and not a shouting series called Seven. A study through the first two chapters of the book of Revelation. You would want to take notes during this series. You're not going to rush me during this series. You're not going to be staring at your clock during this series because I don't care. Because I feel when the Holy Spirit is done with you by the end of this series, man, you'll walk out of here. A transformed man and a transformed woman if you allow God to do that. A transformed church if we allow God to do that. In the book of Revelation, we have preserved for us in the beginning seven letters that were sent to seven historical churches. These seven letters that we are getting ready to study over the next seven weeks in Revelation 2 and 3 were sent to seven churches that formed a circle of influence around what was ancient Asia Minor, what is today modern Turkey in the first century AD. Put my series graphic back up there, please. These seven churches were located along an established trade route a road that ran from one church to the next, to the next, to the next, in a circle that hugged the Aegean Sea. And again, in what is today modern day Turkey. Each church was a major center of commerce, of education, and business, and influence. And each one of these seven churches received a full copy of the book of Revelation, including the letter that was specifically addressed to them. This is important for you to understand because once each church got their copy of their letter, which was the entire book of Revelation, they would read or read that letter out loud orally to their church and because those seven churches had influence that entire letter including the book of Revelation would then be circulated to all the surrounding churches around these seven churches therefore it was the intention of the sender of the letters that every believer who was alive at that time and who will ever be alive and every person who calls himself a Christian it was the intention of the sender that every believer would eventually read the entire book and all seven letters including every believer alive right now that's why there is a blessing pronounced on anyone who reads the entire book the sender wanted you to know what was in the book it was his intention as we go through these letters in study you will find that each letter declares the triumph and failings of the recipient churches five of them who received warnings two of them who received nothing but commendation I want to say this from the onset so you pay attention for the next seven weeks. Pay attention that the five churches that receive some measure of warning, I believe their issues represent 
the five major challenges of all churches across all time for all believers therefore as we go through this study churches will pop up in your mind when you see them in the text when we go through this study you might find yourself in the text because I am convinced that these letters represent all of the issues that Christians will go through from the time they was originally sent until the time Jesus returns for the entire church age so you will find yourself I promise you before these seven weeks is over you will insert yourself right there in the chair under the conviction of the Holy Spirit for good or for bad you will insert yourself right in the text and my prayer is that in that moment man, you would lean into what the Spirit of the Lord says to you to me to us and maybe we might we might turn and be wiser and stronger as a result of that the house says amen, amen. the advice in these letters they are prophetic forewarning present-day Christians and communities of the snares that can shipwreck a person's faith The book of Revelation is not for you to be afraid of, especially if you belong to Christ. It is something to bring trouble for those who are outside of Christ. In context, it is a prophetic book that reveals to all mankind the ending or the final state of all things. Reveals the things that were and the things that will be, whether people believe in them or not. It reveals the end of the church age as we know it. It reveals the end of the world as we know it. It reveals the end of the era of grace, that time will run out for people to make a decision to put their faith in Christ. That time is going to run out. It reveals the end of the clock that we are on right now. It reveals the ultimate fate of the wicked and all those who were not brought into the kingdom of God. It reveals the details of the new heaven and the new earth that will replace what we know right now. It reveals the end of pain, the end of sickness, the end of suffering, the end of death and sorrow. It reveals the end of sin and the final defeat of Satan and all that is evil and ungodly. The book of Revelation reveals the eternal state that is coming for all those who are saved and who remain faithful in Christ, who remain in Christ. It reveals life on the other side of death and on the other side of the return of the Lord Jesus who was coming back, he said, to make all things new. Pay attention that the Lord did not hide the end from anyone. He left the book of Revelation in the earth that those who read it may understand the significance of the time that we have right now. Are you listening to me, church? Before we study, how did we get the book of Revelation? How did it end up in our New Testament Bible? How was it preserved in these 66 ancient documents? This is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. It is probably the most important book in the New Testament. How did we get the book of Revelation? At the ending of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave a commission to a group of men to carry the gospel to the ends of the world. And history tells us those men, they left from an upper room empowered by the Holy Spirit. Peter preaching on the first day 
that the church was born the day of Pentecost. Some 3,000 people was added to 120 people. And now the message of Jesus began to spread throughout all of Jerusalem. It began to leak outside of Jerusalem. It began to leak into places like ancient Antioch and Samaria and all across the Roman Empire until persecution came against those 12 men and those who were followers of the way of Jesus Christ. According to church history, all 12 of Jesus' followers and the one who was replaced, Judas, by a man named Matthias were persecuted and 11 of them were brutally executed, martyred for the preaching of the gospel. One clubbed to death, one skinned to death, one tossed off the temple, and so on and so on. Fox's Book of Martyrs talks to us about how 11 of them met their death in a very brutal way. One of them was boiled in oil in a vat of hot liquid and survived. By the supernatural power of God raised from that bat of oil still breathing but because of his preaching of the gospel and his resilience to not die they banished him to a island called Patmos a prison colony a small rocky island about 50 miles or so off the coast of ancient Ephesus modern-day Turkey and on that island, there were prisoners and people exiled there, sentenced to hard labor, busting up rocks for the rest of their life. That man who was sent to that prison island that is still sitting there in the Mediterranean Sea, his name was John, an eyewitness of the life of Jesus. And John, in his own words, will tell us how he received the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1 John writes this in his own words about the year AD 95 about 65 years after the resurrection of Jesus the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ even to all who saw blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy let me say that to you again you're looking for Bible study. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear you in the chairs, you across this camera, and keep what is written in it for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come from the seven spirits who bore before his throne and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness the firstborn of the dead the ruler of kings on the earth to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us his kingdom priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. That is Jesus is coming and everybody, whether they believe or not, will see him and tremble when they see him coming. Jesus says, quotations, I am the Alpha and the Omega. 
says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom of God and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos and on account of the word of God and in the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus to Smyrna to Pergamum to Thyatira to Sardis to Philadelphia and to Laodicea pause why did Jesus choose these seven churches what about the church in Jerusalem what about the church in Antioch what about the church at Corinth or the church at Rome why these seven churches I believe that in these seven letters again man Jesus addresses all Christians for all time and before this series is over he will talk directly to you from one of these seven letters is why I believe he chose these specific churches verse 12 then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me John wrote and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like the son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest the hairs of his head were white like a white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, which represents judgment, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God. And his face was shining like the sun in full strength. And when I saw him, I like this part. I fell down. I like what John said. I bowed down. And I fell at his feet, although I was dead. John said, when I turned and I saw Jesus, I fell down at his feet like I was a dead man. Pause. Pause. John said, when I saw Jesus, I fell down on my face like a dead man. I could not even look upon the Lord Jesus. I don't understand, John. Did not you walk with him for three and a half years? I don't, I don't understand, John. Did you not see him crucified on the cross? I, I don't understand, John. Did you not see him buried in a tomb? I, I, I don't understand, John. Did you not see him resurrected from the dead? I never saw you fall down even when you saw him resurrected, John. I don't get it, John. Yeah, John walked with him for three years and saw him crucified, even saw him resurrected and never fell down. But what John saw now was not just a resurrected Ooh. Jesus. 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 But what John saw now was a fully glorified A Jesus who had gone to heaven. A Jesus who had sat down in the throne of the right hand of the Father. A Jesus now who had been crowned with many crowns. A Jesus now who had in his hands the keys of death, hell, and the grave. A Jesus who had all authority. When he saw the glorified Jesus, he said, I couldn't even look upon the glorified Jesus. I fell down when I saw him. Pause. Let me remind you. That's the same Jesus you pray to now. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
That's the same Jesus you sing songs about now. Not some baby in a manger. Not somebody who can't deliver. Not somebody whose arm is weak or don't keep his promises. The same Jesus that John fell down and couldn't see is the same Jesus you are feeling in your prayer time via the person of the Holy Spirit. It is that Jesus that I call on now. Not the baby in the manger. Later for that. The Jesus you call in church is the one when John saw, he fell down as a dead man. The powerful, glorified Jesus. Not that name on the bracelet or a t-shirt or a sticker on your bumper. When you talk to him, And when you kneel down in his presence and when we write songs about him, man, we dealing with that glorified Jesus. It made me feel a different kind of way, Francesca, when I come into his presence. That's why I get fed up when people treat him like a sucker or a homeboy or they blaspheme him you know who you're dealing with? you got any idea who you're dealing with? how we sit down during worship or can't open our mouth and say hallelujah you know who you're dealing with? how we can't lift a hand or be faithful. Do you know who you're dealing with? You're dealing with a glorified Jesus. How we don't take him serious or take his serious or take his word serious or take prayer serious when we're dealing with a glorified Jesus. That for your own sake he don't appear to you lest you fall down like a dead man or a dead woman. That's who we're dealing with. So we don't play around when we come in church. I don't play around in my prayer time. I ain't playing around when I open that Bible because I'm dealing with a glorified Jesus. church I lead, I won't let you play him like a sucker. He's worthy of me standing in worship. He's worthy of me singing and lifting a hand. He's worthy of my little offering that I be clutching. Your little two dollars. We want to make it rain in the club and can't bless the church. Man, he's worthy of that offering. He's a glorified Jesus. Man. He's worthy of my sacrifice. He's worthy of my serving. He's worthy of me being involved. He's worthy of my, he's worthy of that. Not the baby in the manger, the glorified Jesus. Am I talking to you? Yes. Can I hurt you? Yes. He's worthy of me showing up on time for the first song. Yes. You do that for your boss, but won't do that for a glorified Jesus. Yeah, no. We got more respect for men than a glorified Jesus. You got more respect for preachers than a glorified Jesus. More respect for Philip and Stephen Furtick and T.D. Jakes and fill in the blank than a glorified Jesus. Do you, 
do we know who we're dealing with and who we worship? And we be nervous at the enemy's attack when I got the full force of a glorified Jesus? What? 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 That's why I'm thugged out in the kingdom. I ain't nervous at no demonic attack. I got the full force of a glorified Jesus. What you talking about? Why your tail always between your legs? Why your head always down when you serve a glorified Jesus? I'll fight a devil in a minute. Ain't backing down from no fight. Watch. I ain't walking away. I'm not going to abandon him. Why are you nervous? Why are you always afraid? Why are you can't step out on faith when the person that will catch you is a glorified Jesus? gonna fail you when he's a glorified Jesus how someone with all authority is gonna fail you I'm gonna wait for a good answer how someone with all authority is gonna fail you man I'm in trouble elder I didn't even get into the sermon yet I can't. I'm in trouble already. I see them with the clock on me. I ain't even get into the sermon. I... Y'all be looking at me like I'm a fanatic? Nah, I got a revelation of a glorified Jesus. I ain't afraid of nothing except God and the IRS. Elder, can I go deeper? I didn't even get into my sermon. How are we going to preach foolishness behind the sacred desk when we're supposed to be preaching and representing a glorified Jesus? I'm just trying to thug you out. So the next time something don't work your way, you don't panic and tuck your tail and run and sit down and bow down and all that. You know how to get a prayer through to a glorified Jesus. I'm just trying to put a Holy Spirit battery in your back and remind you who you serve. Not the baby, the glorified Jesus. Somebody give him praise right now. writing songs you writing songs and you writing songs right we writing songs about a glorified Jesus so we write with authority in the name of Jesus you heard me you heard me and we preach with authority because we represent a glorified Jesus you heard me
Let me come to your house and you pray. Pray with authority because you're praying in the name of a glorified. with authority there's somebody on my staff wife was healed of cancer by a glorified Facing death. See, wife facing death. And he and I and my wife, we refuse. I said we refuse. Pound in heaven's door. Beckoning the help of a glorified of a glorified Jesus. What am I going to do? I didn't, even, I didn't even get into my sermon. I could, I could take this message out of the series and just start with week two and when you go home or I could, I could, I could preach it what do y'all want to do that means you're not going to get to the restaurant on time you, you tell me what you want to do <clears throat> I, I, I could dismiss us right now and just start in week two let me know what you want to do do you, do you want this or not Yes? 
No, I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious. I'm serious. I could dismiss you right now. Yeah. Later for being handcuffed by everything. I, I want Holy Spirit encounters on Sunday. So, no. This church may not be for everybody when I'm done with you, but those of us who belong, like, nah, we're going to meet God here and then in your house. So I, 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 I could let you go and start at week two. I, I didn't even get to the message. What do you want to do? All right, sit down then. Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. Verse 17. But he, the glorified Jesus, laid his right hand on me, saying, <laughs> He's talking to you, fear not. Dang it. Fear not. For I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Man, if he holds the keys of death, you don't got nothing to fear. That's why he can heal a body yeah. of cancer. Yeah. Write, therefore, the things you have seen, those that are, those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, And the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the churches. Father, help me to preach the rest of this word, whatever it's going to look like. In the mighty name of your son, I pray. Amen. Thank you, men. Thank y'all. If y'all going to sit there, keep your eyes on me. Or to take a seat and keep your eyes on me. You sure you want this? In the Old Testament book of Proverbs, written by a man named Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, and a few Proverbs written by other men under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In Proverbs chapter 20, there is a very popular verse that we put on T-shirts, bracelets, and on every vision board Y'all know this verse, right? It says, without vision, the people perish. And so we culturally take that verse and we use it as our launching pad to give birth to anything that we desire. Because we said we must have vision. Because if we don't have vision, if we don't see what we want to do, then our lives will perish. And so we use that verse to give birth to our dreams, aspirations, and desires. I'll give you grace for that. But I'm a Bible teacher. And in its proper context, as recorded in the ESV, my favorite translation, because it is one of the most accurate translations according to to history connected to the original manuscripts of the Bible. My wife and I saw some of those original manuscripts, some of the Dead Sea Scrolls that are in the Antiquity Museum in Israel. According to Proverbs 29, 18, in its proper context, the passage will read, where there is no prophetic vision, <laughs> the people cast off restraint and then we stop there, but we don't read the rest of the verse. 
But blessed is he or she who keeps the law. Let me repeat the verse to you again. Where there is no prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one, he or she, who keeps the law. Let's interpret the text. Where people have no knowledge of the future. They have no control over their present lives. I.e., when they have no knowledge of what's going to happen in the future. They live today like tomorrow does not matter. When they have no knowledge of what's going to happen in the end. They live as if they have all the time in the world. Where they have no prophetic revelation of the things that are coming. They live as if they have all the time in the world. Why do I bring this up? Because the reader of these two chapters was supposed to be the reader of the entire book. And if you read the entire book of Revelation, you would bump into the revealing of Jesus of the things that's going to happen in the end. I want you to notice that he did not hide that from humanity. That the Lord wanted all of human beings to know what was going to happen in the end. And he sent these letters to seven churches to all Christians that one day somebody will sit down and read the whole entire book in addition to the seven letters. And then you would have now a prophetic vision of what's going to happen in the end. The best way to have a vision is to start with the end in mind and then work backwards. When you have a personal vision for your life, you start with the end in mind because when you start with the end in mind, it teaches you to not waste the time you have right now. And if anyone would just read to the end of Revelation, you would get a wake-up call to how valuable are the days you have right now. You will get a wake-up call to how valuable is the fact that your name is written in the book of life. I'm going to give you homework. I want you to read Revelation 20 and 21 and 22. Read the last three chapters and then come in here next Sunday for worship. I want you to just get a peek. Don't even read the whole thing. Just get a peek at the end, 20, 21, and 22. Just read the last three chapters. You could do it in 15 minutes. Just read it to the end that you may have a prophetic vision of the things that are coming with the hopes that the Spirit may shake you about how important your time is right now, your talents are right now, your prayer life is right now, the people you know who are far away from God, how important it is for you to be praying for them right now. So Jesus began this entire end time revelation to the church that bears his name and all of us, beginning with the ancient church in Ephesus. Let's unpack these seven verses really quick, and then I'll send you home. In revelation chapter 2, he begins the entire book of Revelation to these seven churches. Again, I'm saying this over and over so you understand, although we're only going to study through two chapters he sent seven copies of the entire book to seven churches. That means they would have read their letter and the entire book. That's why I encourage you one day to read these letters and the entire book. So when we study them, you need to understand that they got their letters and the entire book. He wanted them to have knowledge of the end. He begins the entire book, the entire revelation. In Revelation chapter 2, let's teach these seven verses really quickly. Verse 1, to the angel in the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So he starts with the church in Ephesus, ancient Ephesus. The church in ancient Ephesus historically are some of the greatest ruins right now in antiquity. You can still see the ruins of the church in Ephesus in modern day Turkey. Beautiful ruins. The church in Ephesus was a prosperous church. Ephesus was, think New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Dallas, Houston, major metropolis. A quarter million people living in Ephesus the largest church in Asia Minor, hundreds, 
thousands of Christians in the church at Ephesus. Think mega church. Think the largest churches in America. This is the church in Ephesus. Large, wealthy, prosperous, the most famous church in that region of the world, the first church in that circuit along that Asia Minor Road. This church, and this is important, had some of the best leaders in the history of the church. Men like Apollos was a leader in this church, preached and taught there. Men like the Apostle Paul was a leader in this church, preached and taught there. Men like Timothy was a leader in this church, preached and taught there. Men like John himself was a leader in that church preached and taught there. That means Ephesus was not only a mega church with a mega budget in a major city, but they had some of the best pastors and leaders in the day. Oh God. He says to the angels of the church, right, who are the angels of the church? Scholars argue, we don't know for sure. But in context, we believe that the angels of the church represent, in Greek, the messengers of the church or the pastors of the church, the leaders of the church. He says the stars are the physical churches themselves. So the angels represent the leaders or pastors. The stars represent the actual church themselves. He says, watch, he says that the stars are in his hand, meaning that Jesus has in his hand every leader of every church. His hand represents the agency of either blessing and goodness or the agency of discipline and wrath. Meaning no leader is going to get away with anything. They all, we all, I all will give an account to Jesus for how we stewarded the pulpit behind these sacred desks. Play around if you want to. You're going to have to give an account for how you handled these 66 documents. He says that none of them are going to escape. But they stealing money and they buying this with church money. And you don't got to worry about all that. And I'm not going to give my tithe because he's stealing money. You ain't got to worry about all that. They can't escape the hand of Jesus. He says he holds the angels where? In his right hand. Representing the agency of either goodness or wrath or discipline. That's why he can raise them up when he wants. You know where I'm going with this? And sit them down when he wants. He can bless them when he wants and expose them when he wants. He can put them in the ministry when he wants and snatch them from their office when he wants. No angel is going to get away with anything. And then notice what he says. He says, he walks amongst the lampstands. Do y'all see that? The lampstands are the churches. Jesus says he walks among the lampstands, meaning the Lord inspects and assesses every gathering of believers in the world that call themselves any name of a church. That there's no church anywhere, let's just stay in America, that the Lord does not know the heart of the leader, the heart of the people, and everything that's going on inside that church. He knows every gossiper in the church, every slanderer in the church, every blasphemer in the church, every troublemaker in the church, every liar in the church, every faithful person in the church, every godly person in the church, every ratchet person in the church. He walks between all the churches, assessing them, taking inventory of them. This is important because you should think very carefully about the church you belong to. Because whatever church you belong to, your body has to give an account to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you shouldn't choose a church just because it has good air condition. Or it can satisfy, let's go deeper, all your desires. I don't like the children's ministry, church hop. He preached too much truth, church hop. They brought discipline, church hop. 
That pastor has a bigger IG than Philip Anthony Mitchell. Church hop. You better be careful if you're a guest how you choose the congregation you belong to. Because the Lord walks up along between the lampstands. And notice he calls every church a lampstand, which means he expects them to give off light. But let's go deeper in the text. Let's go deeper in the text. No one needs a flashlight in a lit room. So the tech prophesies that everything outside the church is darkness. So the text prophesies everything outside of God is darkness. So when I go to work, I go to work in darkness. When I go to the gym, I go to the gym in darkness. When I go to my campus, I go to my campus in darkness. When I'm moving around Atlanta, I'm moving around in darkness. And since the church is not a building but people, means I'm supposed to be the lampstand in any area I am in darkness. So I'm supposed to be a light in the gym and not acting ratchet in the gym. I'm supposed to be a light at my job, a light in my cubicle, a light in traffic. Christians, right? I'm supposed to be a light everywhere even when people are not watching. So I don't park in handicapped spaces if I'm not handicapped. Unless you want God to give you a reason to park there. I'm a light on my taxes. I'm a light in my business. I'm a light in my marriage. I'm a light in my parenting. He called you a lampstand. Not a building, a people. Somebody asked me one day, where's your church? I said, everywhere. Y'all missed that. My church is not a building. We just use it to gather. So if he calls you a lampstand, you should be a light everywhere, all the time, representing him. That's why people got a problem with God now, not because they got an issue with God, but they really got an issue with the people that claim to represent him. A lampstand on IG, a lampstand on Twitter and Facebook, like a lampstand is only for dark places. So he's telling you that everything outside of us is a dark place. It's why he said in the Sermon in the Mount, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. How would they see light if you don't light that spot up? You ain't got to preach everybody down. Just live right in front of them. They need to see Christ through you. So he not only inspects every church. Can I go deeper? He inspects you. Assesses you and me. Like everything is bare in this room. You got on clothes, but in the spirit, we're naked. Ain't nothing hidden in the room. Can I go deeper? Yes. And since nothing is hidden in the room, is why you can pray with honesty. Oh, yes. I just help somebody. Yes. So you don't have to tiptoe in with your tail between your legs. Yes. When he already know you messed up last night. Yes. He already know you was angry. He already know that you have a bad mouth. Like you ain't got to tiptoe in because he already know. Yes. So it gives you the freedom to just be honest. Yes. Lord, I am angry. Yes. I am jealous. Help me with this. Let's run through these real quick. Verse 2. He says, I know your works. I'm going to move quickly because I know you want to get to your restaurant. (laughs) 
your toil and your patient endurance. This is good. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Uh, watch this. This is powerful. But you have tested those who call themselves apostles. Do y'all do that? No? You like everybody posts on social media. Every false prophet. Every false apostle. You sending them money and liking their posts. Do you know a lot of people say foolish things eloquently? A lot of people preach heresy eloquently. A lot of preachers preach heresy eloquently. And because it sounds eloquent, you don't know it's full of the devil. You, we, we love articles, but not the scriptures. And we love your 4 a.m. opinions, but not the scriptures. If I wasn't pastoring, I want to be in a church where they open the scriptures, walk me through the text, instruct me what to do, step on my toes, confront me, convict me, challenge me, coach me, inspire me. Don't leave me the way I am right now. Stop telling me I'm awesome every single week. Tell me I'm nasty. Tell me I'm sinful. Tell me I'm going to burn in hell if I don't turn. Tell me. Save me. Oh, I get it. Oh, they never read Ezekiel. Where God says if you don't tell the truth, their blood is going to be on your hands. And if you don't tell the truth, I'm going to terrify you. I don't want God on me. So I preach the truth to you. Because I don't want your blood on my hands. Not going to hell for you. Not going to have blood on my hands for you. Not going to compromise for you. A crowd, a platform, a following. I refuse. I refuse. And if it makes me unpopular, that's all right, though. I'm a big gangster on this side of the fence. And I'm going to hold it down until I get my crown. And one day, some of y'all, we're going to be sitting at that table together eating bread and fish. And you're going to be like, yo, pastor, go looking on that sermon. Go looking on that series. Yo, you hurt me in that series, but I'm here, though. Yo, you stepped on my toes, but I'm here, though. Yo, you made me feel convicted by the Holy Spirit, but I'm here, though. Like, yo, thank you for not lying to me because I'm here, though. I got a seat at the table. Yo, good looking, pastor. Yo, good looking. Good looking. I almost sold out, but you wasn't compromising, yo. I came to church, you sent me home crying, but good looking, though. I'm at the table. Somebody say, I'm at the table. I can't hear you. Say, I'm at the table. Somebody should turn that into a song. I'm at the table. I, I feel a song in my spirit. I'm about to drop 16 on you right now. Yo, I'm at the table, son. I'm at the table, B. I'm at the table. Oh, we turn into a worship song. I am at the table. We at the table, son. The truth of God's word put me at the table, son. Somebody holler at your boy. Shout, we at the table. We up in here, though. We're going to be like, yo, pastor, it wasn't sexy. We took a long time to get a building. Yo, people was talking about you in the city. They were, but, but, but yo, we at the table, though. I don't know where they at. At the judgment, we're going to be like, whoo. Somebody just give me one of these right here, like, 
I'm going to tell you what you don't want to hear. You did all of that in my name, but depart from me. You workers of iniquity. I never knew you. For them grim reapers to come get you, you can't come up in here. From there. There's no getting out from there. No? The scripture said Judas died and went there. He'd been there for 2,022 years. Pause. I need to say that one more time. Judas, who betrayed Jesus, the scripture says, was damned. Watch. Woke up in hell. He's awaiting for what's going to happen at the end. You should read Revelation 20, 21 and 22. He'd been there for over 2,000 22 years and then another 2,000 years will go by and then another 2,000 and then another 10,000 and 100,000 and 100, 100,000 years and he's never going to get out But, but, but you don't want to help spread the gospel. And you don't want to help push gospel ministry forward. You don't want to give to that. You don't want to serve for that. You don't want to pray for that. You don't want to be a part of a church that's serious about it. You don't care about that because you haven't read what's going to happen in the end. So watch. Because we have no prophetic vision, we cast off restraint. That's why the book is called Read the last three chapters. Take you 15 minutes. It might shake you. It might make you pray for your loved ones who are not saved. It might make you stop coming to church and playing games. It might make you support gospel ministry and pray for gospel ministry and do all you can to sell, promote, uh, not sell, promote, support, post about gospel ministry. Why don't we make it rain for Jesus? That one, that part. Listen to what he commends them for. Um, I need to, let me just hurry up. He commends them for, can I teach? Yes. He, he, he commends them for, for their toil, their patient endurance, for not bearing with evil, for testing false prophets. In verse 3 he says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. I mean, I, but I just love how Christ takes the time to watch, commend them for what they're doing. This is so dope for all my coaches. You want to be a life coach? I like how he takes the time to commend them for what they're doing, right? Why does he do that? He uses that as relational equity to buy their ears so they will listen to him with a heart of sincerity for what's coming next. What a brilliant way to talk to people. Let me buy your ears with some relational equity by taking time to tell you the things you are doing right. Parents. Parents, that part, parents. Right? And he buys their relational equity. He says to them in a sense, watch, he commends them for their toil, for their endurance. This congregation was dedicated to the work of God even when it was difficult. I'm feeling them. I'm feeling Ephesus. Watch. This congregation was showing up every week, pressing through temptation to be wary, pressing through the temptation to say, I got burnout, and they quitting. Man, they pressed through all of that. I got, yo, I got, yo, clout for them, yo. Right? Like that, right? Like they, they doing this thing for real. They showing up every week. 
They're not serving one week and saying, this is too much for me, and they bowing out. Nah, they, they toiling. They pressing through. They showing up every Sunday. They serving when they tired. They serve without being wary. They never made excuses. They didn't say, I'm going to burn out. They just kept going. They were serious about doctrinal purity. They shut down false teachers and false apostles. They were serious about doctrinal purity. They protected themselves from false teachers and false teachings, man. They did not allow foolishness in the pulpit. This church was filled with godly activity. They were sacrificial. They were paying a price to serve the Lord. They were steadfast in their gatherings. This church had great work ethic. This ancient mega church was a model for other churches, akin to like some of America's greatest churches in size and highly organized in structure. By all these commendations of the Lord, I mean, Let's just keep it real. Ephesus has all the trappings of a successful megachurch. Anybody know any of those? Successful megachurches. Prestige, size, wealth, following, perfect presentation. Man, this, this was Ephesus. However, the one who walks among the lampstands of our nation's churches saw in their hearts and had a different diagnosis than what we see on the surface let's finish the text real quick verse 4 but I have this against you y- y'all do all of that well but I, I have this against you let's, I want you to pay attention pay attention pay attention pay attention the spirit is talking to you pay attention you, you do everything well but I have this one thing against you you have abandoned the love you had at first. You are busy. You are sacrificing. You are preaching. You are singing. You are serving. You are even giving, but you have heart trouble. When people see you, they say there is a radical Christian, but you have heart trouble. They displayed great works and great labor and patience. But all these qualities were motivated by their work ethic, but not motivated by a love for Christ and people. Watch. They were physically busy, but emotionally empty. Financially rich, but lovingly bankrupt. Can I say something to you? What you do and what I do for the Lord is important, but not as important as why you do it. Everybody give you props for your what. We see what you're doing, but your what is not important as your why. And when we lose the why behind the what, the what, which is your work, becomes wasted. So the Lord knows you show up for church, but why? The Lord knows you serve faithfully, but why? The Lord knows you give consistently, but why? Is it routine or is it love? I'm talking to you. Is it obligatory or is it love? I'm talking to you. Is it the check from the church or is it love? I'm talking to you. Here is the question born out of the rebuke of the text to the Ephesians and for all of us. Here is the question. What is the source of your Christian activity? Is it for fame? Is it for props? Is it to be seen? Or is everything you're really doing in the name of God, is it really doing, are you really doing it out of love? He said, you forgot your first love. I'm almost done. Your first love, anybody, you you know what that sounds like? You remember that time you first fell in love with someone? Like your first love? You know how people act when they first fall in love? You giddy? Watch, watch. Let's be real. You want to be around that person all the time? You be talking to them to three in the morning and falling asleep on the phone? You ever been around a a new Christian? can't tell them nothing they on fire they never miss church they serve on three teams they give faithfully they study their bible they be praying faithfully when they go through hardship they're positive 
They just believe come hell or high water. The glorified Jesus is with them. But, 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 but watch, let time pass. Time has a way of wearing down my prayer life. Time has a way of wearing down my commitment. Trouble and hardship has a way of wearing down my commitment. Time and trouble and hardship and disappointment and he didn't answer my prayer has a way of wearing away and eroding my love. The truth of the matter is there are people sitting in this room right now faithful but not for the right reasons. How do I know? Because you know. Because your love is like you see people as numbers but not as brothers and sisters. You don't really love. If you, you don't really lo if love covers a multitude of sin, you don't really love. You, you get offended so easy. You can't have a conversation. You can't say I'm sorry. It's like we don't really love. This church Reminds me of established churches that are so perfected in programming that really the people are just going through the motions. God forbid the Holy Spirit disrupt the gathering. God forbid we stay a little bit longer. God forbid we just get on the floor and pray. God, God, God forbid, it's like it's it, it, everything is so we yo we got activity and programs and blah blah and it's and it's big and it's money and blah 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 but man in the hearts of the people man we just we just ride in the waves of the motion. That's what big and wealthy don't mean successful or affirmed in the eyes of Jesus. And I'm not against large churches. I mean, this church, I'm not, a, the, the first church in Acts was a mega church. I'm not against that. I, uh, what the Lord is against is you going through the motions. So you in worship like this. Praise him. <laughs> Clap your hands, everybody. Ain't no love there. You're not really in love. What? You love what he can give you, but you don't love him. We love what he can give, but we don't love him. See? Because when I love him, right, he is the reward. How many of you, and I'm almost done, can really be satisfied with just Jesus? If you, don't, if you don't get the fill in the blank, could you be just satisfied with Jesus? Do you love him when he's not answering your prayer? He said, let me finish. We see this all throughout the American church. It's people in this room, people watching a Christianity apart from love, ministry apart from love. Any ministry apart from love, it's either self-serving or it's grudging. It's drudgery. This wounds the heart of Christ. It's possible to serve and sacrifice and suffer for his namesake and yet not really love the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the church in Ephesus. Maintaining separation but lost adoration. It's labor, labor, Labor is no substitute for love. Neither is purity a substitute for passion. You could be pure but no passion. You can have labor but no love. A church must have both. Here's a mega church, ancient Ephesus, sound in doctrine, mighty in works, and external virtue. And yet, I learned something reading about this church. <laughs> I see in them what I see in a lot of us, what I've seen in me, that sometimes every virtue carries within self the seed that brings its own destruction. Everything that is virtuous inside of it, if it's not properly stewarded, has a seed that brings destruction. Like for example, uh, uh, without guardrails, morality can turn to self-righteousness. Without guardrails, the virtue of passion can turn to zeal without wisdom. 
Without guardrails, the virtue of contentment can turn to complacency. For them, the virtue of work ethic turned to lovelessness. They created an environment so mechanical and rigid that love was eroded. This is why truth without grace puts a beating on believers. Because we, we hyper-religious without love. Like, how would you have dealt with the ratchet woman at the well? Or the woman caught in adultery? Or that thug that was up in a tree? We, we, we hyper-religious to do God's work, but we don't have love in our hearts. So we don't have grace. We don't deal with people right. Notice Jesus came in grace and truth. forget the one who saved us, what he saved us from, what he saved us to, what he forgiven us of, we forget Jesus is rebuking this church about the main thing that must drive all Christian endeavors love one author wrote this about this text he said good works and pure doctrine are not adequate substitutes for that rich relationship of mutual love shared by those who have experienced for the first time that redemptive love of God. There's no substitute. The Ephesian church had forsaken its first love, its love for God, its love for humanity, its love for each other. And when you truly have the love of God in your heart, you will love him above all things. You will love your brothers and sisters deeply. These are, you will love them deeply, even if they get on your nerves. But watch, let's go deeper. You will stop hating on the sinner. Why do you want Jay-Z to go to hell? You would love the people who are far away from God and pray for them. Let's finish. If love is lost, how do we regain it? Verse 5. 6 and 7. Remember therefore verse 5 where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So here's what the Lord said to them. Here's what he said to you and I. If you find yourself just really going through the motions here is the pathway back to fire. First he says remember. Remember what it was like in that season when you was on fire. When you had love when you was praying, when you were serving, when you was faithful, like just ha get a flashback in your mind when you first got saved. I do this all the time. Every now and then, I'll be outside staring at the clouds or I'll be laying in my bed and I get a flashback to when he saved me. When I was so happy just to be in the kingdom, I didn't have no platform. I wasn't called to be a pastor yet. I was, I was dirt broke, and, 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 and Lee and I had nothing but each other and Jesus. And I had so much joy in my heart because I felt like, wow, I'm saved. And I just love Jesus. And however you want to use me, I'll be faithful. And man, get a flashback to when your life was like that. He said, remember to when you was full of love. Then he says, once you get that flashback, he says, repent, turn away from just going through the motions. And then he says, watch, repeat, do your works over. That is the things you did that kept you burning for me. Go back and start doing those things again. Man, pray like you used to pray. Read like you used to read. Take the prayer walks like you used to do. Remember those things that used to have you hot? Man, throw those coals back on the fire again. He said, remember Repent, man, repeat. That's the pathway back to love and fire. Why? Because no one cannot drip from the Lord and not pay a price for that. If we drift, the only thing that follows drifting is damage. I'm being honest with you. Now, see, now you don't want to be at the table now. You're looking at me with your hand folded. I thought, I thought 20 minutes ago you was at the table. Right, you, I'm at, Pastor, I'm at the table. I'm at the, you, I don't see you at the table now. You, you want to sit at the table? The only thing that follows drifting from Jesus is damage. When we drift, the only thing following that, like Sonic and Tails, is damage. Nothing good comes from drifting away from the Lord. Man, I, 
I'm, I'm done, Frank. I'm, I'm done. I, I didn't want to go to the restaurant. You know, I, I want to say, give me that camera. To some, some pastor, some preacher, some, some brother or sister, somebody watching me right now, you, you, you've drifted away from God. Preaching and drifting, singing and drifting, serving and drifting, giving and drifting, all of that work, heart not really in it. You know it. He knows it. I, I, I feel the Spirit of God speaking to some of you in this room, beckoning you. Watch, man, return to me with, with, with weeping, with fasting, with prayer, like set your soul on again. Like, like love again. Like the Lord is saying to some of you, like, I, I'm, I'm not done with you yet. Like, I'm not done with you. Like, I want your heart and not just your activity. Yeah. Verse 6 and 7. Yet this you have, you have hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans was a sect of false teachers who was teaching a mixture of Christianity and licentiousness, Christianity and ratchetness, under the guise of grace, giving people a license to sin and live any way they want to live. You can live any way you want and make it into heaven. Lies. That was the Nicolaitans, tearing up churches with false doctrine. He says, why? Jesus says, I hate that kind of preaching. Look out for it in today's society. Whenever you hear it, oh, you can do whatever you want in grace. And you hyper grace that God, Jesus says, I hate that kind of preaching. Hate. Verse 7. We done. Remember he addressed the whole church? Now he gets personal. But he who has an ear to hear, let him or her hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So watch, he's talking to a church, but Jesus is so gracious, he recognizes even the people who are real in a bad church. To the one who conquers, I will grant you to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Conquer doesn't mean fight here. In the Greek, this original word, you don't need to know it. It just simply means the one who remains faithful to the end. You don't abandon Jesus. You don't abandon his love. Look at me. I'm, I'm done. Look, look right at me. Guys, I don't know how else to say this, but except repeat my Savior. Look, look right at me, right? Like, yeah, we in here deep and we come to church and we serving and we singing and preaching and all of that. Man, the Lord said, is that Shant oh, Shanti? I see a missionary in the house. Yo, what's up, yo? Some of your giving has helped to support a missionary that's in our house. Um, And as you continue to give, we're going to support this missionary that's in our house. A missionary that came out of our house and we released her to go pursue her calling, moving to another nation soon. And this church will support her on the other side of the world because she is serious about gospel ministry. But let me, let me lay, let, look right at me. Eye contact. Right here. Give me the camera. Right here. Jesus said, your Savior and mine, that the world would know that you are serious or you are not a phony by your Instagram following. No. By how well you preach. No. By how well you sing. No. How well you serve. No. By how well you give. No. 
How well you post? No. He said, by this, the world would know that you are really my disciple. The only way they're going to really know that you're authentic and you're not a phony and a fraud is that you love one another. The evidence of authenticity is love. You're not authentic because you're blowing up on social media. You're authentic when you can love and let's go deeper. Love those who are unlovable. And even the ones that hurt you. That's real. He said, by this, the world would know that you are really my disciples. Like, do you love me? I'm talking to you. Do you love me? I'm talking to you. Do you really love me? Yo, I love you. I really do. Do you love me? Yo, I really love you. And I believe in what you're doing. I really do. You love me? I love you. You love me, daughter? I know you love me. I friggin' love you. Like, love. That joint, it feels good. It covers a multitude of sin. It apologizes. It says, I'm sorry. It goes back to the spouse and says, my bad, I'm sorry. It is self-sacrificial. It's patient and kind and gentle. It keeps no record of wrong. It does not throw things in people's faces. It lets things go. It doesn't keep grudges. It does not wear its feeling on its sleeve all the time. It asks a question before it wants to be understood. It says, I don't know why he said that or did that, but let me have a conversation instead of trash him on social media. I mean, love. It's self-sacrificial in service and giving. It sings with love and preaches with love and it shows deference with love. I mean, like, man, there's nothing that feels more powerful, Luana, than love. I mean, DeAndrea, like, love. My right, Brittany. Man, I feel like you should just hug the person next to you, like, just like, 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 love. Like, 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 it, it feels good to, this is my brothers and my sisters, man. Like, by this, the world will, come here, girl. Like, by, by, by this, the world would know that you, you my disciples, that you love. We hang out in the lobby and we love and we go to Atlantic Station together and we love and we eat and we love and we get in small groups and we love and we love and we, we're not going to just be busy without love. I want everyone this week to take an inventory of your heart. And I want you to be honest with yourself. Am I doing Christianity with an emotionless heart? Am I serving Jesus without love? I want you to take a real inventory. I want everyone this week, here's your homework, to have a moment alone in a park, in a prayer room, in silence, and take an inventory of your heart, an MRI. Say, am I coming to church, serving, giving, posting? Do I really love the Lord in my heart? Do I really love people? Or am, I, am, I, am I skeptic of people all the time? Am I not trusting? Am I, 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 do I really love people? Do I really love? And if you find that it's not there, watch, repent. And ask God what Paul prayed for a church. Let your perfect love be shed abroad in my heart by the power of your Holy Spirit. That's your homework this week. I want you to take an inventory of your heart, an MRI. And you're going to read Revelation 20, 21, and 22. So you have prophetic vision. Love. Somebody say love. Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray your perfect love will be shed abroad in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that it would explode out of our lives first towards you. Not for the things you give, but for who you are. It would pour out of our lives for our spouses and children, 
our friends, our family. And beyond that, it will pour out our lives for our church family and for the sinner. I pray we will so be in love with the sinner that we will be grieved when we see people who are far away from you. That in love we would pray for them because we have prophetic vision of the end. Let this church explode with love. And let every activity done in this church be motivated by love for us local and those abroad in the mighty and majestic and matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody, can you put your hands together and say amen?